Sleep is a strange behavior. For a third of our lives, we must remain still and unconscious, vulnerable to predation and away from all the activities that wakefulness permits. We cannot eat, drink, socialize, and critically, we cannot spend the time finding a sexual partner. An oddity, it would seem at first glance, an aberration that evolution will gradually remove. Yet sleep is found everywhere we look, from bats to birds, to fish to insects to mammals. Indeed, no sleepless animal has ever been found. That such a sleepless animal has not emerged must mean that it is simply not viable to go without sleep. Yet on my journey to discover more about why we sleep, I stumbled across a theory that suggests otherwise, that sleep did not originally evolve in order to fulfill some essential function at all. Perhaps the characteristics of sleep, unconsciousness and immobility, are not the unwanted side effects of some higher purpose, but rather the reason itself. I went looking for an answer to why we sleep, but instead found a question. Why do we bother being awake at all? There is no doubt that sleep is critical for good health. If you or I were to have just one disturbed night of sleep, we could expect our memory to decline, our stress levels to be higher, our creativity to take a dive, and our immune system to be worse off. Chronic sleep disturbance seems to be tightly entwined with serious mental disorders like major depression and schizophrenia, and it increases your lifetime risk of stroke, heart disease, diabetes, and obesity. In light of these dire consequences of sleep deprivation, the answer to why we sleep might seem intuitively obvious. We sleep to restore our health and prevent these conditions. But these are complex and drastically different disorders. What possible common mechanism could there be? And why must we spend so much time unconscious to prevent them? I am to talk with a man who seeks the answers to these questions and more. He is Professor Giorgio Gelestro of Imperial College London, and he does not try to unlock sleep's mysteries through human studies, but instead through fruit flies. Uh, my name is Giorgio, I'm a lecturer here, senior lecturer in the department, uh, which I joined about 10 years ago. <clears throat> uh, my lab studies sleep, in particular we try to understand what the function of sleep is, and we do this using uh, fruit flies. Right, so fruit flies are the most commonly used genetic animal model in research. So it's common to study um, any biological property that has genetic underpinnings uh, in a model like fruit flies. We can recognize sleep in these flies because they follow the same patterns of sleep regulation as us and other animals. I asked Giorgio about these regulators. Right, so the current view is that sleep is under regulation of two phenomena, as you said. Uh, on one end, you have the unmutable drive of circadian rhythm, which make an animal, or should I say a species, more likely to fall asleep a certain time of the day. On top of that, you have another process, which we call a homeostatic process, um, of which we know much, much less. And that process regulates your sleep need based on your sleep history. So if you have a nap in the afternoon, you will have a hard time falling asleep in the evening. If the animal is really um, an animal that sleeps normally, then you would expect to see a rebound. And that's exactly what we see with flies. So we're using homeostasis as part of the definition of sleep. Exactly, yes. Okay, okay. So, there are two drivers of sleep, the circadian driver and the homeostatic driver. Circadian driver is a 24 hour, roughly, periodic cycle that syncs your body and the processes within it to the rotation of the earth. It means that you feel sleepy in the evening and then more awake in the morning. Homeostasis, on the other hand, as Giorgio says, has a sort of memory. It's not synced to a clock. It is more a reflection of how much sleep you have had in the past and how much sleep you will therefore need going forwards. As we can see here, normal amount of sleep, normal amount of sleep, sleep disruption, and therefore a recovery sleep, which is longer and deeper. The homeostasis regulator is particularly important when considering the purpose of sleep. The fact that we require recovery sleep suggests that, by interrupting our sleep, we have failed to fulfill some function, which must then be recovered. 
Giorgio explained how sleep's conserved function across species also seems to indicate a fundamental function. When we look at sleep, most of um, the aspects we look at um, are conserved throughout evolution. Okay, so I, I mentioned inactivity. Um, there's uh, clearly uh, sleep rebound. Uh, um, also, the effects the sleep deprivation has on, say, cognitive performance, they are also conserved. So flies, for instance, they will not learn as well as they normally do if they are sleep deprived. Same thing that happens with us. Now, why is it so? What is the evolutionary uh, uh, pressure to maintain this inactivity? As you say, there might be an underlying biological function. So something that happens and must happen while we sleep. Um, and the fact that it's present throughout uh, evolution suggests that um, this function must be shared somehow from flies to humans. A shared function that, once evolved, was too important to remove. For an investigation into sleep, we are spending much time talking about evolution and conserved phenomena. Let's take a quick refresher on what these concepts mean. Consider organism A and B from the same species but variants of each other. If we look at their DNA, that is to say, the information that defines the organism's characteristics, like fur length or eye color, within the same species, we'll see natural variation as indicated by this green portion of the DNA and the red portion of the DNA. Now, DNA is unique to every organism. Uh, that is what makes some people have brown color hair and some people have blonde hair. But what can happen is sometimes these variations can actually increase the organism's fitness. That is to say, the likelihood that it will pass on its genetic information to its offspring, just as you inherit your genes from your mother and father. Now, if an organism has a variant, that means it is more likely to pass on its genes, its DNA, so A is more likely to pass on the information than B. What we would expect to see is, within a mixed population of A and B, gradually this population will shift towards an A-dominant population. For our purposes, we can consider an animal that sleeps to be the A variant and a sleepless animal to be the B. This is because, as Giorgio previously said, sleep is found everywhere, it is highly conserved, and therefore must be conferring some sort of advantage over a sleepless animal. The question is therefore, why is it so conserved? Why is it found everywhere? How does the sleeping organism A outcompete the sleepless organism B? Look at some of the functions that an organism must fulfill in order to successfully reproduce and pass on the DNA. What must an organism do? It must eat food in order to take in energy and use it. It must, in the case of a mammal, maintain stable internal body temperature. It must breathe if it's an animal, take in oxygen and dispel carbon dioxide and ultimately it must reproduce. Now, if any of these are not fulfilled, the first three of which would immediately kill the organism, and the last one would, from an evolutionary perspective, do just the same thing, because if any of these are not fulfilled, then the DNA will not be passed on. So, if the variant A is for some reason better able to fulfill some or one of these functions, then it's more likely to reproduce and pass on its DNA. The question is, is sleep one of these essential functions? Would an organism die if it went without sleep? And if not, why is sleep found everywhere? The evidence for a fundamental function of sleep is mounting. It is found everywhere. It must be recovered through homeostasis if lost, and abstinence from sleep has dire consequences. But there is a second idea hidden amongst these lines of evidence, one that can equally explain these observations. The other answer, which is not excluded at the moment, at the moment and in fact is something that I found very appealing, is that the main advantage of sleep is to be inactive and out of danger. Could sleep's original mystical function be just that, mystical? Might the reason for sleep be more humble but equally intriguing? That sleep is simply a way to stay still and out of trouble. This idea of adaptive inactivity is not new. For many species, inactivity is often a favorable state. Hibernating mammals, dormant plant seeds, even single-celled organisms display temporary dormancy. When conditions are unfavorable, it is better to lower the metabolism, find a safe place, and remain immobile. 
So you might think, some people think that uh, sleep is a dangerous state to be in because it uh, exposes you to predation or to danger. But as a matter of fact, you'll realize that uh, every animal actually has a, a sleep ritual that um, makes safety the center of their sleep. So they, you know, they go to a nest, they hide in a cave, they, 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 they just get away from, from danger. And so um, there is an advantage of spending uh, as much time as you can in a state of inactivity because you actually are um, in a safer state. Could sleep simply have evolved as another form of adaptive inactivity? A balance between wakefulness, a state during which one can eat, drink, socialize, and sleep, a state that does not permit these behaviors, but lowers the risk of injury and saves energy. Often in biology, it is easier to prove something wrong than right. So let's start with this hypothesis. Sleep performs some fundamental function for life. How do we find contradictions to the claim? Giorgio started with the most basic question. What happens if we aren't allowed to sleep at all? We know that if you don't eat, eventually you're going to die. We have no idea whether there is anything similar for sleep. In fact, there is only one study that showed uh, in the 60s that sleep deprivation will eventually lead to lethality. And that was a study that was done in, in rats. You can keep rats awake for about 21 days in a row and eventually they will die. However, they'll die in a way that is quite miserable. These animals are stressed out, they lose fur, they are not really happy about their overall condition. So it's always been unclear whether they die out of lack of sleep or whether they die because sleep deprivation is inherently stressful. Uh, they cannot obviously be done in humans. Uh, you cannot sleep deprived a man until they you know, to check whether they die. And so the question remains, is it sleep deprivation eventually lethal or isn't? The lack of studies into complete sleep deprivation led Giorgio to conduct an experiment in fruit flies. What happens to flies if they are constantly kept awake? We kept the flies awake basically for as long as we could, expecting them to possibly die after maybe a few days or a couple of weeks. And what we found was very surprising because we found actually that we could keep the, fl the flies awake basically throughout their lifespan and their lifespan was not any different from the control or very, very, you know, if there was any difference it was very limited. Sleep is obviously important for the species but it's not as vital as food or at least not vital in the same way food is. These results apparently contradict the notion that sleep performs some essential function. Giorgio's experiment did not only examine the effect of forced sleep deprivation on flies, but also looked at natural variation within the species. Do some flies naturally sleep more than others? By how much and are there any correlations with lifespan? They found massive variation, with some flies naturally spending less than 5% of their time asleep, while others were close to 50% of their time. What could explain this difference? Right, so it could be that uh, whatever function sleep has, uh, it, it, it's, possi it's theoretically possible that some individuals are more efficient are condensing that function in uh, fewer hours of sleep than others, right? So you could argue that uh, if, an, if a human being uh, sleeps only for four hours a day and another um, one sleeps for nine hours a day, to one end you could say, those who sleep four hours, they're just more efficient at doing whatever sleep is doing in lesser time. Or you can say those um, who sleep um, eight hours, they, they have the same degree of efficiency, but then on top of that, they also have some um, different uh, set amount of sleep that they have to satisfy. If we consider sleep to be some inconvenient activity that simply must be performed because of a mysterious important function, then a highly efficient short sleeper would have the selective advantage. They would perform this dangerous behavior faster than their competitors and then move on to the more beneficial state of wakefulness. Over generations, the population would gradually shift towards all efficient sleepers, and the longer sleepers would be eradicated. The fact that we don't see this drive towards short sleepers within a species means that this 
sleep efficiency cannot be so advantageous that the time spent asleep is itself the advantage. The next nut to crack is homeostasis. Why do we need recovery sleep if it is not performing some essential function? If you think that um, sleep as a function, uh, obviously by losing sleep you must recover it and recover that function. But there are some things that don't add up because, for instance, if you uh, sleep deprived for 12 hours during the night, the day after you're not going to sleep 12 more hours. You're going to sleep maybe one or two more hours. So what we did is um, we subjected flies to different uh, intensities of sleep deprivation. So some animals had lost, say, all of their sleep during the night, and some animals had lost uh, only a few minutes of sleep during the night. The way we did this was by programming our robot to disturb the flies only after an interval of specific length. And so what you end up with is that flies that lose dramatically different amount of sleep. And you would think that those who have lost only a few minutes of sleep during the night will show no rebound the day after. They should not be tired. Well, in fact, they are. And it, it kind of matches what you see in humans. In humans, sleep disruption, even if it's subtle, has consequences in the morning. So you know, all those new parents who have babies know that to wake up just once or twice during the night, even if it's just for a few minutes, actually has a toll the day after. The non-correlative recovery sleep seems misaligned with our hypothesis that sleep is fulfilling some essential function. Take other essential functions. A severely dehydrated person will need to make up for all of the lost liquids, not partial amounts. Likewise, a starving animal must make up for lost calories. Why then does homeostasis only partially recover the sleep? Giorgio compared the situation to lunch. Every day our body tells us to eat something at a particular time. Should we miss a meal for some reason, the urge to eat increases. Another example of homeostatic regulation. Uh, is it because I actually need those calories, which is very unlikely, because I have you know, a good reserve? Or is it because my body wants me to have those calories and obey my regular homeostasis? And the same I apply to sleep. So the fact that you don't feel 100% uh, after losing a few minutes of sleep during the night, is it because you've lost those few minutes of sleep? It's unlikely. Or is it because your body wants you to maintain sleep throughout? Rather than making up for lost function, recovery sleep might be more about correcting your behavior to a more optimal amount of daily sleep. This would explain such disproportionate amounts of recovery sleep. The peculiarities of sleep homeostasis go further. In some animals, uh, it's even more extreme than this. There is no rebound sleep at all, but only certain times. So for instance, those uh, migratory birds I mentioned to you before, they fly all the way to Alaska and they fly all the way to Alaska because it's mating season. So they, after a very long trip during which they hardly sleep, if they do at all, they arrive there and it's mating season and they have to compete for females. And so you snooze, you lose. So they try to stay, they try to stay as awake as much as they can again. Um, and so it's a continuous, a very long period of sleep deprivation that is never recovered. So there is never sleep rebound after the sleep deprivation. And so we wonder whether the true was uh, 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 whether the same was true in flies. And we did a similar experiments where we use a sex drive, as in the birds, to see whether the sleep that you lose. Uh, with sex drive is sleep that you're recovering or not. And it turns out that it is not. So you can, you can keep a male fly awake all night by just um, giving them either a female next to them or the smell of a female. That's enough to create a sexual arousal that competes with sleep drive. So this animal will stay awake all night. The day after you transfer them in a, in a new environment, they don't recover for the sleep they've lost. The rebound is completely you know, forgotten. And so it tells you that this, re this need for sleep rebound is not religiously fault. It's, it's, it's uh, dynamic, it depends on conditions, and it depends on what biological drive is more important for you at this stage. If you forego sleep for, say, sex, in that case, that's good for the species, so it's, it's okay, it's allowed. Yeah. So, recovery sleep does not always occur. But didn't Giorgio earlier use recovery sleep as the very definition of sleep? The way by which we can recognize sleep in fruit flies. Does that mean that the earlier disturbance of sleep demanded recovery, yet this type of disturbance does not? If you put two many flies together in the same environment, 
They also will lose a lot of sleep during the night, just because there is, I guess, aggression and competition. The day after, when you remove those flies and put them in different chambers again, there is a huge rebound. They actually do try to recover the sleep they've lost. It's like a hierarchy yeah. of, of, of biological drivers. Yes. Should something prevent you from eating or breathing, you will make up for it, irrespective of the manner of prevention. Yet sleep's necessity seems to vary. It wanes in the face of more pressing needs. A hierarchy emerges. If a biological driver interrupts sleep, but it's, it's almost higher up the list, then there's no rebound. That's, that's what we see, yes. And, and so that balance with the fact that uh, obviously migratory birds can go a long time without, without sleep and not have a rebound. Right. The fact that there's such variation across species and the fact that, uh, I mean, within the same species, some are quote unquote more efficient at sleeping and they feel fine. Right. You would think that wouldn't everything just become more efficient? Right. And yeah. It looks to me like you're putting together the same pieces of the puzzle that yeah, I put together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, if it, if it, I mean, you can't forsake food just for sex, otherwise right. eventually you die. But you're saying that, through from what we can see, that's what this is. And whereas it would make more sense if, rather than being a functional thing, if it's a balance between danger of going outside right. and reward, that's why not everything's become more and more efficient asleep. Right. If you can afford to be asleep for so long, why not doing it? So if you're a bat, you're a small animal, you're a carnivore, so you can get a rich diet of insects and that covers your need. You have time to socialize for a few hours a day and then you spend the rest of your time asleep. On the other hand, if you are an elephant and you're a herbivore, you need to eat a lot to maintain even just your uh, size and so you cannot afford to stay asleep for hours and hours throughout the day. You have to keep eating and moving. Um, and so sleep is kind of a balance between what you must do and what you can afford not to do. I call back to the question, why do we bother to spend time awake? By posing this seemingly silly question, we derive insight into the reverse. Why do we sleep? We spend time awake to fulfill those functions that only wakefulness can provide. But beyond this, what purpose does wakefulness serve? From an evolutionary standpoint, it serves no other purpose. Thus, when these tasks are complete, better to crawl into a familiar, safe place than remain active and at risk. Though perhaps a more mundane existence, the unconsciousness of sleep prevents us from participating in risky behavior. It curtails pointless energy expenditure. It forces you to stop. In this way, it seems that we are simply slaves to our genes in their long game to survive and replicate. Our journey is progressing, the momentum building. I must speak with more researchers. I know that there are counter arguments and I know that the profound benefits of sleep continue to emerge. How can these tie in with the adaptive inactivity hypothesis? I must find out more.